It says, El Nino Fidencio, a heart filled with compassion. I'm going to sing a ballad I request silence. Please, I'm singing gratefully. El Nino Fidencio cured me. I was a cavalryman, very brave and determined, but a stray bullet left me very badly wounded. The doctors told me that my case was difficult. And so my poor mother brought me here to Espinazo. Espinazo. These lines from the beginning of the Corrido del Nino Fidencio, the ballad of Nino Fidencio, reflect the experiences of thousands of individuals on both sides of the border from the late 1920s to the present day. Even though these verses were recorded and presumably written in 1927, a person is sick and the doctors have not been able to help, but a cure is effected through the powers of a remarkable curandero who continues healing to this day, more than 60 years after his death. And by, when this book was written was, excuse me, 2003. So, José Fidencio Constantino Cintora was born in Iramuco, uh, Guanajuato, in the fall of 1898. His parents were mestizos rather than Indians. Yes, this book refers to native people as Indians. It's, it is what it is. We find conflicting traditions concerning his family. In some, his father was named Socorro Constantino, while in others his, fa his father's identity is uncertain. He may have been one of a family of 14 children or the 14th of 25 children. These details matter little to our story, but I mention them to show that uh, El Nino, like other individuals treated in this book, gather legends and narratives about him. We do know he had a younger brother, Joaquin, however, who spent much of his life near Fidencio. Uh, by 1913, Fidencio was in uh, Yuriria, Guanajuato, and assisted the local priest as altar boy. At the age of 13, Fidencio had started working as a kitchen boy for the local Lopez de la Fuente family. He had attended school with young Enrique Lopez de la Fuente, who probably took him north to work at the family hacienda at Espinazo. Es Espinazo. I hope I'm saying that right. Nuevo León. There he stayed until his death in 1938, always in the company of Henri Enrique Lopez de la Fuente and accompanied by his younger brother. Always in the company? Hmm. Speculation there. According to legend, Fidencio at the age of eight set his mother's uh, uh, set his mother's arm when she broke it in a fall. Later at Espinazo, Espinazo, he showed great ability to treat animals and assist at births, both animal and human. In other words, he became known as a partero, and that's very unheard of for a man to be essentially like a midwife uh, or male midwife. There. <laughs> Here you go. He already had skill and reputation as a curandero, using herb remedies with deep understanding of their properties. He received the gift for his activity in a childhood vision from a bearded man. The man, whom Fidencio believed to be Jesus, showed him a book containing many herb cures, enabling Fidencio to cure his brother who was sick at the time. In Espinazo, Espinazo, I can't get the emphasis right, however, came the vision that changed his life. It was 3 o'clock in the morning on August 15, 1927. Fidencio was sitting under a little pirul, or a pepper tree, praying to the Celestial Father and contemplating human bitterness and suffering in contrast with God's love for humanity. He received instructions from Divine Providence to hold a large gathering on the nearby Cerro de la Campana, because Campana, there's no Enya here, um, on March 19, 1928. It was from this gathering that Fidencio's mission as a spiritual healer dates. Cerro de la Campana, the hill of the bell, well, it would be Campana, is a common name in Mexican topography. There is one such hill, for instance, in Hermosillo, Sonora, and a much more famous one outside of the city of 
Gere, Geretaro, where the Emperor Maximilian was executed. At about this time, Fidencio met Theodoro von Wernich, a German-born spiritist, and cured him of a previously incurable ulcer. In return, von Wernich promised to make El Nino famous. From that time on, von Wernich and Lopez de la Fuente served as El Nino's advisors and publicists. Beginning in 1928, then, El Nino Fidencio grew in reputation as a healer. And it says here, And even President Gaius, tired of suffering, crossed mountains and valleys and came to see Fidencio. Mexico at this time was in chaos, with the revolution coming to an end and the federal government quite literally at war with the Catholic Church. In Central and West Mexico, battles were fought. Prominent individuals on both sides were assassinated and priests were executed. Many of these priests have since been elevated to sainthood. Although the so-called Cristero War officially ended in 1929, scattered holis, uh, holis, holi, uh, hostil, uh, hostilities, oh my god, really? Continued well into the 1930s. It was again this background of social and religious fracture and disruption that Fidencio played his highly public role as a healer. He performed his healings in front of hundreds, perhaps even thousands of people. He welcomed reporters and freely talked with them. In fact, it was probably the, 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 the spate of newspaper articles that appeared in Mexico City and elsewhere in 1928 that inspired the huge crowds and started arriving at Espinazo that year. Indeed, El Nino welcomed all comers. When Dr. Francisco Vela, Vice President of Nuevo León's State Committee of Public Health, visited Espinazo, why can't I say that word? In 1930, he was immediately un ushered into El Nino's, presidents, El Nino's presence and then shown all over the area. Above all, El Nino encouraged people to photograph him. Here you go. Uh, the photographs exist in great numbers and are treasured and traded among Fidencio's followers today. Many show El Nino at work curing patients and some even show him performing surgery with a bit of broken glass. One fascinating picture shows Fidencio sitting next to one of his patients after an apparently successful operation. A camera rests in his lap. Many of the pictures that show El Nino with his patients have captions written onto the photo in white ink. These photos have become the counterparts of the traditional ex-votos or retablos so common in Catholic countries in recent centuries. In these, the subject of the miracle is shown lying sick in bed or suffering an, an accident or even an assault, while interceding saint or aspect of Christ hovers above to one side. A text at the bottom explains the miracle. Just look up ex voto. Other pictures are, are portraits of El Nino holding a puppy, posing with a child, dressed in riding boots and white riding breeches breeches, or just looking somberly into the camera. El Nino reported, reportedly loved children and animals. He also loved to dress up, and many of his costume changes were captured on film. He is most often shown, however, wearing either a white robe or white shirt and trousers, which with a white kerchief around his head. In one story, a young boy, son of a Spanish immigrant, had suffered an accident with a firecracker that caused him to go gradually blind. His doctors held out no hope for him, so his parents took him on the twenty uh, oh, I'm sorry, on the two week journey to Espinazo. There they camped for weeks in a brush shelter waiting for El Nino. When they finally stood before the curandero, El Nino told the mother that there was no need to explain how the boy lost his sight. He massaged the boy's eyes for a few minutes with his fingers, then lifted his own eyes as though he were having a vision. After some time, El Nino lowered his head and, continue, and continued massaging the boy's eyes. At last, he said, Ya estás curado. Now you're healed. 
He requested that a handkerchief be brought and put over the boy's eyes until early morning light. Next morning, as the bandages was removed, the boy exclaimed, Ya veo! Or, I can see! Another story tells of a man with chronic uh, dyspepsia to the point where the smell of food made him sick. After the doctors had given him up as, a hopeless, as hopeless, his wife went with him to Espinazo. The niño entered their tent and, without asking any questions, began to massage the man's stomach. When, the depart, when, they de when he departed, Fidencio left a bunch of bananas to eat, even though the wife said that fruit made her husband very sick. However, the patient asked for a piece of banana, ate it, and continued eating till he had consumed four bananas, at which point he was violently ill. The next day, El Nino massaged the man's stomach with a paste made from fruit, soap, and medicinal herbs. By the second day, the man had improved greatly, and by the fourth day, he walked for the first time in months. In yet another account, a young man from Monterrey had gone insane and his parents brought him to Fidencio. The healer extracted the young man's teeth. Following this, the young man regained his sanity. A doctor from Torreón, who witnessed this himself, reported to have been cured of paralysis by El Niño. Resonated, uh, reasoned that an infection in the young man's teeth had affected his nervous system and caused the insanity. Mm. The grateful young man said, stayed in Espinazo to work in Fidencio's household. Some of Fidencio's cures revealed, reveal a sense of playfulness. For instance, he led a deaf mute near a swing and proceeded to swing back and forth, bumping the patient each time. The man became very angry and found his voice for the first time in several years. On another occasion, on another occasion El Nino treated a paralytic by throwing sweets just out of her reach, forcing her to stand if she wanted to eat one of them. He would also perform general cures throwing food tortillas even eggs from the roof into crowds below whoever was touched by one of these objects would be cured he is said to have danced with people to cure them and given parties for his patients prescribing herb baths laughter and food he made sure visitors to espinazo were fed and entertained perhaps el nino's most famous cure involves uh plutarco elias calles president of Mexico between 1924 and 1928, and behind the scenes ruler until 1936. Here's the outline of the story as I heard it from Fidencista in Robstown, Texas. Robstown. President Gaius came to Espinazo on a special train with the intention of having Fidencio killed. Although President Gaius was incognito, Fidencio recognized him without difficulty and knew why he had come. El Nino visited the president in his private car and said to him three times, do what you need to do. He then left and continued treating those who had come to see him. When Gaius came to see Videncio, he had to stand in line like everyone else. It was a hot day and Gaius was wearing a suit and tie. He pulled out his handkerchief to mop the sweat off his brow, forgetting that this was the prearranged signal for his men to shoot the Nino. However, they did not shoot. For a reason not mentioned in the story. Instead, Gaius fainted and had a vision that seemed to identify Fidencio with Christ. When he came to, he was brought to Fidencio, where he fell on his knees, begging for forgiveness. The narrator here explained that Gaius was a mason, and masons aren't supposed to kneel to anybody. Fidencio commanded the president to strip, which he did, down to his underclothes. At that point, it was discovered that Gaius had leprosy. El Nino cured Gaius of leprosy, but in exchange, Gaius had to make a truce between the government and the Catholic Church, thus bringing the Cristero War to an end. On another occasion, the Archbishop of Mexico visited Fidencio incognito, apparently with ill intent. El Nino recognized him. This is but one version of the Gaius story. Gaius story. Others have it that Gaius' sister was cured, sometimes of leprosy, or that his daughter was cured. Most accounts agree that after Gaius's visit, El Nino received large quantities of supplies from the federal government. 
I have not heard or read elsewhere that El Nino was responsible for the agreement between church and state in Mexico, an agreement reached in 1927, and which is conventionally laid at the door of Dwight Morrow, then United States Ambassador to Mexico. Readers familiar with European-derived folk tales would perhaps recognize several familiar motifs in this narrative. The importance of the number three, the disguised evildoers recognized by the hero, and the accidental signal for execution. I find it comforting in a way to see such age-old narrative details attached to a story concerning happenings in 20th century Mexico. That these stories exist in many different versions does not bother most fidencistas. Uh, different people have different knowledge, different versions of the stories, and different ways of performing their tasks. We hear many stories about Fidencio just as we find many photographs of him. Discrepancies and details don't really matter, but the faith of El Nino is vital. It is shared by all and unites his followers. In the late 1920s and early 1930s were the heyday of El Nino's fame and popularity as a healer. At any given time in those years, Several thousand people might have been camped at Tiny Espinazo. I've heard that in 1928, for a while afterward, more people purchased tickets for Espinazo than for any other destination in Mexico. A post office branch was open to cope with the large quantities of mail that flowed into the community. Just like, it seems like, just like the Don Pedrito story about the post office. Attempts were made to organize the site on orderly principles with dirt streets being laid out and named a room was dedicated for surgery and another room held glass jars containing tumors that had been removed these are still there there was a maternity ward a place set aside for the insane a separate place for lepers and a school and there was also a cemetery for those el nino could not cure Accounts tell us that he recognized many of these cases upon their arrival before him, re uh, remarking to the crowd, A person is coming who is wasting his time. Tell him to go off and prepare for his death. I can't help him except to pray for him. That sucks. All this activity did was... All this, all this activity did not go unnoticed by the state health authorities. As Fidencio did not claim to be a doctor or prescribe medicines... The press stated the authorities would not intervene, but they were deeply concerned about the health menace created by the thousands of sick, incurable, and dying people who were congregated in one place. During the last years of his life, Fidencio was under almost constant attack, by first by the medical authorities and later by the Catholic Church. He was twice arrested and taken before tribunals in Monterrey, but without a conviction. During this period up to his death in 1938, his importance as a media figure declined, while his popularity with, with the El Pueblo, the common folk, continued unabated. What was this man like? Photographs and eyewitnesses accounts give us a fairly good picture. An article in El Universal del México for February 16, 1928, described him as a young man of few words, muscular with a sort of yellowish color and very simply dressed. Dr. Francisco Vela of the State of Nuevo León's Committee in Public Health reported after this his visit in 1930 that Fidencio looked serene and intelligent and that he had a rare, almost yellowish skin color. He also had thick lips, a full set of large teeth and light colored eyes that chose to look away from the intruding eyes of visitors. Indeed, in many of the photographs I've seen, El Nino is looking away from the camera. He had no visible facial hair, smooth skin, and a high-pitched voice. No sexual involvements with either men or women have been reported of him. He seemed asexual. Although the spiritists would have loved to claim him as one of their own, he denied contact with spirits of the dead, saying rather that his healing powers came as a gift from God. Often when healing, he would go into a trance-like state, emerging with a cure for the patient he was working on. He had special powers for, of knowledge and could pick out individuals not known to him from a crowd. He would often work for days and nights without ceasing, sleeping a few hours, and set to work again. He was uh, abstemious in his habits, consuming mostly liquids. He usually dressed in a white robe or tunic and went barefoot. 
His living arrangements were simple in the extreme, consisting of a crude wooden bed, chair, and table. Even so, people say he preferred sitting and sleeping on the floor. He did not ask payment for his cures. Whatever food supplies and money were given to him, he redistributed among his followers. As he walked from place to place within his hospital at Espinazo, he was followed by a healing circle of hundreds of people. I have given examples of some of his playful seeming cures. Music and dance were important to him, and he encouraged both among his followers. Among the music heard in Espinazo were and still are, songs, hymns, rather, in his praise. He also distributed fruits and candy, throwing them out among the crowds. The impression I gain from all the descriptions I have read and heard is of a serene, a sincere, uncomplicated, almost childlike man, deeply concerned for the suffering of others and equally deeply convinced of his healing mission. During his lifetime, he was already being compared to Christ. Like Christ, he healed and preached a message of love. Like Christ, he went to a nearby hilltop to meditate. Like Christ, he used water, in this case from El Charco, the sacred pond at Espinazo, in ritual ways. And like Christ, he was accepted to live for only 33 years. This would have put his death in 1931. But in fact, he lived until October 1938 when he died just short of his 40th birthday. His remarkable public career as a curandero lasted just 10 years. His death, like his life, has been surrounded by legend. Some of his followers believe that he, like Christ, died at age 33 despite documentary evidence proving contrary. Many will tell you that he was killed by doctors who were jealous of his healing powers. El Nino told his followers he would go into a trance for three days and then arise again, they say. His spiritual qualities caused him to swell, however and the doctors thought he was dead. They cut his throat to embalm him or to perform an autopsy and thus killed him. There are photographs of El Nino on his deathbed, surrounded by, by flowers. Others say that he hastened his own death from precious anemia. No, I'm sorry, from precious, from pernicious anemia by working for 72 hours at a time, hardly ever eating or resting. This extreme bloating of his body that occurred during his final trance or coma is attributed by some to the anemia, by others to his intense spirituality that puffed him up, and by still others to the fact that he had been dead for a while in hot weather. He was buried by special permit, some say, in his house where his tomb is still visited by thousands of pilgrims annually. And it goes on to say that there's a whole following of people, which they call fidencistas, which you can find online. And... Um, I'm just talking about his resting place. And here it says, this is Espinazo with fidencista and other devotional materials for sale. This is some photographs sorry if you can't see it and then here's another picture it says roadside monument to El Nino Fidencio between the main highway and Espinazo so that's it okay so what I heard about Nino Fidencio was that he spoke in a high-pitched voice and he didn't have any facial hair. So people assumed that he, he was like physically stuck kind of like in a childlike state. And that's why he liked to hang out with children and with animals because like he closely identified with them. Kind of like the way some people say Michael Jackson did, but on a, on a different level, obviously. And the yellowish skin tone and all that. I, I just heard of that just now, but some people that that I have spoken to and seen online said that he died of exhaustion because he would go, yeah, days at a time without eating or sleeping or anything like that. And just people were working him to the bone basically. And he was already fragile. Like he already had something wrong with him, like 
you know, from birth and people were just like draining him dry. So that's what I heard. And he would, whatever you see, if you then see this online, they'll talk like this because they feel like they've been embodied by the spirit of Vivencio and they talk like this because they swear this is how he used to talk. So yeah, I hope you like that one. Um, after that, it's the book uh, goes into, let me see, it goes into, it just says more saints. And it says here, a portrait of Father Kino by Sonoran artist Nereo de la Peña inside the dome over Kino's gravesite in Magdalena, Sonora. So I don't know who this is. I never heard of this guy. Mm. And then there's another picture here and it says statue of late Luis Donaldo Colosio in the Plaza Monumental of Magdalena, Magdalena Sonora on a spot where the murdered candidate gave an important address. And I don't know, it just says that they're more folk saints. Yeah, Kino, Seda, and Margil. Yeah, that's all it says. That's pretty much the end of the book. The only one that I didn't go over in this one is Teresita, Teres, I always say Teresita, Teresita Urea. And that's a long, drawn-out story, but she was another healer. Um, also approached by spiritists. It seems like Don Pedrito... Nino Fidencio and Teresita, Teresita Urea were all approached by spiritists. They wanted to know, like, how are you doing this? Um, and I think there's Pancho Villa in here, too. Uh, as a folk saint. I, okay, I'm going to say this. I personally don't like Pancho Villa because he used to steal from my great-grandparents. He used to steal their cattle. And they had to hide their children in fear of him because he would try to abduct the little girls. So you won't see me all Pancho Villa, Pancho Villa. No, no, sorry, not with my family. Um, and we know went over Jesus Malverde. This is Teresita. That's Teresita. Pretty woman. Uh, all kinds of politics involved with her. And Juan Soldado, who was a soldier, or they proclaim was a soldier. So, and just kind of like a an explanation of who the folk saints were. This is hard to find online. So good luck if you find a copy. Um, that's it for now. And, um, yeah, thanks for watching.